you doing, everyone? This is Robert Rivera with Who's On First, and we have a special guest, uh, Jim Nipper. That's correct. From Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim. Back in my uh, my younger days, which would go back 40 plus years, uh, back in then we used to have a very popular contest in the spring to become the bat boy of the local AAA team. Okay. At the time we were owned by the Baltimore Orioles for many, many, many years. Uh, that contest involved um, sending in an essay, and then there was a follow-up luncheon with politicians and baseball officials uh, where you were interviewed and ultimately selected as either the home bat boy or the visiting bat boy. And um, I was fortunate enough that day, said the right things, knew the right things, uh, came my way where I was selected as the home team bat boy for what could arguably be called the greatest AAA baseball team ever. Okay, okay. What years were those? That would have been 1971. Next year, eight players from that team alone went to the big leagues. And okay. Back then, that was a big deal. Maybe one or two players might graduate to the big leagues. Um, I took a year off and came back in 73, 74, and 75 as the clubhouse manager. Okay. And uh, through those four years, uh, my exposure to an inside organized professional baseball team, um, uh, memories that I'll never, ever forget ever. Okay. Uh, very lucky that way and uh, still keep up contact with a fair amount of those guys from back then. Okay. So you were the clubhouse manager. So what, what, did, what was your job? What did you do? Well, if we took it from the day uh, that a game would start, which typically was 730 at night, when the players showed up at four o'clock, the locker room was spick and span, uniforms were in place, uh, any of their gear that they needed was clean, spikes were shined. And uh, throughout the game, there might be a reason for errands or just to be in the clubhouse for something that they might need. After the game was when my job really started because after the game, as the players would uh, toss their uniforms into what we called the wet cans, which basically meant the cans to collect uniforms that would eventually be washed and dry cleaned, uh, it was my job to pick all those up, keep them separate, uh, look for the extra dirty stains and probably be at the ballpark to 1 2 o'clock in the morning. Only to come back the next morning at 8, 9 o'clock and see what's gotten dried, what still needs to be cleaned, hire some neighborhood kids to help me with the spikes and hang out. And pretty soon players show up at 4 o'clock and we would do it all over again. Wow. So was that for a season or how many days it was that? Well, uh, minor leagues is 144 games, so it was 72 home games. Okay. When they were there at home, it was my responsibility. The last day of a homestand, I would be packing their gear to get ready, and back then, they would travel by bus. Okay. At the end of that game, I'd send them on their way, um, and then I would be off for as long as they were away. All right. Like so what were the what were the big dollars that they were paying you to do all this? Um, believe it or not, um, I did pretty well for 1973. I think I can remember clearing better than three grand one summer. Wow, three grand! That's some good buku back in 1971, huh? It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> in baseball, what what uh, what do you love about baseball? You know, myself, um, I did not, of course, play professional baseball, but I've played my fair share of uh, organized uh, softball, some pretty competitive levels in that. Okay. Um, I would just say the whole um, camaraderie that goes along with baseball, uh, all the stuff that goes on in the bench or in the clubhouse. Um, and then, I don't know, I just think it was always the batter against the pitcher. You know, you had to contribute as a team. Right. And the games played well, and people understand hit and run, play in, play out, um, throw behind the bag, those kinds of things. So I just generally like the game. And my older brothers put a bat in my hand when I was a little kid. So perhaps like you or what you do with your son, you learn to play the game. Yeah, that's uh, was, so that was your first glimpse into baseball was your brothers? Sure, as a youngster, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, for me, it's more family oriented. I was just talking about, uh, 
my cousin uh, Victor, and he was he was telling me about his dad and how he watches the game. And um, he's like, hey, dad, you know, who are you rooting for? Who's your favorite team? And he says, I don't care. I want good play. That's it. There's no, just, just good play. He goes, it doesn't matter who's playing, you know? So good play. Now, you mentioned this 1971 team. And I know that's probably something we could talk about, you said, for about two, three hours, correct? You got a couple oh, hours. Easily, easily. But uh, the 1971 team, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. I'm intrigued. Well, I can tell you, if, uh, let me think if I can think off my feet here fast. Uh, the leadoff was a guy named Richie Coggins, a right fielder, or a center fielder, um, who at bat second was uh, Don Fazio at second, and then third was Bobby Gritch. Okay. Don Baylor. Right. Harry Crowley. There's three guys that spent time in the big leagues. Uh, we had a real grind em out catcher by the name of Jim Hutto who was uh, the field general and really helped a lot of the baseball pitchers coming up from Baltimore to make it to the big leagues. Uh, we had a pitcher named Roy Harrison. In uh, 1971, he struck out 18 Toledo Mud Hens in one game. That was pretty impressive as a minor league pitcher to do that. Right. Um, so there's uh, Gritch and Baylor and Crowley, um, Roy Harrison, uh, Johnny Oates was uh, another catcher on the team. He went to the big leagues and was also a coach. Um, the, the, the Orioles always seemed to bring through the farm system just guys that were good, solid team players. And back then, when they started, signed the contracts, they started in rookie ball. And mostly as a team, they went up to A and then to double A and then to triple A. Uh, I'm not sure how it is now, but from year to year, the teams all seem to change and disintegrate and start all back up again. Whereas right. these guys all knew each other and played with each other for one, two, three, four, five years, hoping to make it to uh, to the big leagues. So we had quite the star-studded team. Um, won the International League, won the playoffs, the Governor's Cup, and then won the Junior World Series. That's a heck of a lineup they have there. What is, what is your fondest memory of that 71 team? Well, you know, <laughs> those guys got along so well and they knew each other so well. It, it seems like um, I could probably come up with some stories that happened on the field, but <laughs> often enough, the whole, uh, the whole uh, team uh, relationships that they had, um, there's, a, there's a story I can tell you, among others, plenty of them <laughs> probably. Uh, Rory Harrison uh, was a hunter and he brings a... Uh, <laughs> shotgun into the stadium now this is back then when guns aren't what they are today this was something that was off to the side and he found himself a uh, a pigeon that was underneath the stand ballparks would collect pigeons because of all the food that was around right so he takes out this pigeon and of course we don't know what he's going to do with it mike ferraro was a ball player of habit Ferraro would come in and he would stand in front of his locker, creature of habit, do the same thing every game as far as undressing, dressing, uniforms on the left side, a towel. He just didn't want to get out of his routine and he wasn't much for talking. He was all focused. So Ferraro, used, they called him Nino, I think was his nickname. He um, used to always have uh, submarine sandwiches between uh, batting practice and the start of the game. So Ferraro was out taking batting practice and Harrison in a submarine sandwich was sitting on his uh, stool. So Harrison went over to the sandwich with the dead pigeon and opened it up and took the food out and put the pigeon inside. And so of course you've got uh, this uh, uh, same size and you look at uh, the blood and then you think maybe it's ketchup. So of course all the players now are sitting around their lockers. The room at the time was U-shaped. And everyone was in on the secret. So they come in off of batting practice. And they're watching Ferraro sit down, put the towel around his neck. He's got a sub in front of him. He's got his locker all arranged behind. And he opens up the sub, pulls it out. And he looks at it. And he opens up and, and he realizes what it is. And he starts to get sick to his stomach because he had a very weak stomach. And he puts the towel over his mouth, runs into the toilet. And you got 24 guys that are just laughing and falling on the ground. It was just absolutely 
hilarious. It was terrific. It was fun. That's a, that's a that's a gag reel within itself. That one. It's wow. A good, yep. that, that's a that's a good one. So I mean, was there any outstanding plays? Something like a clutch moment that you got to witness? Well, Harrison's 18 strikeouts. It was a game uh, in Rochester, a home game. Let's see. Um, did Gritch hit one over the center field scoreboard? I'm trying to think. Um, <clears throat> uh oh, I'm stuck. <laughs> I can remember um, uh, opening day, and I, it was chilly. And I remember sitting in the on deck circle, and he followed the ball off 45 degree angle, and I managed to stop it with my left thigh. And okay. it uh, came pretty hard. I mean, I didn't even have a chance to get out of the way. I don't know if that would count for anything. But <laughs> No, that's that's fine. That's fine. So, I mean, you you were in the stadium a long time, and I, as you can see, I have the backdrop behind me. You know, any any great stories about the stadium? That stadium that's in your background was built uh, 96, 97, 98. So the stadium when I was there was over at 500 Norton Street. And really a throwback to when we had a clubhouse and then we had a tunnel way under the ground that would come up into the uh, dugout. Uh, just a quaint stadium, terrific infield, outfield, grass. Uh, but like anything else, it was aging and the lighting had to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't at that, um, at that stadium. How many, uh, how many seats in that other stadium? Uh, I think one night, I think they put 13,000 in there. So let's say seating was maybe 10,500. Okay. Do you remember what a what a cost of a game was at that time? Couple bucks. Couple bucks. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably box seats, reserve, and general admission. So, what kind of food did they have at there? Just straight hamburgers, hot dogs, or? Well, we used to have these terrific Italian sausages, just smothered with grease and and uh, pickles and uh, uh, hot pickles. Um, we also. Um, have Zweigel hot dogs in town here. Okay. So that okay. would always be a favorite there. French's mustard was available. It was a company that was here. So the food was truly, truly ballpark food. Okay. So let's let's go on to uh, you mentioned something about Bull Durham. Yeah. And the, the Red Wings, and there is a connection there. Right. As you can see, I'm wearing the red and the black for the Red Wings here. Uh, but I was I was telling my wife. I remember this is the Eugene M's and they yeah. were one of the teams that they had played. This is actually the newer version of it. Hold on. The, uh, the M's there. Oh yeah. That's, this is one of the newer, uh, packs that they have. She was sure. just in Oregon. Sure. She was just in Oregon. Right. So, um, they had played in that movie bull Durham. And I told my wife, I said, they don't belong there. They're a ball team. They're playing against a triple A team, and she was like, What? And I was like, Yeah, sure. exactly. Sure. <laughs> but so explain to me the connection there the Red Wings and the Bull Durham movie. Uh, we had a uh, infielder by the name of Ron Shelton, and uh, Shelley is from California. And he and Bobby Gritch actually played a lot of baseball together back in high school. Maybe they knew each other in college. Shelley and Gritch were on the same team. Gritch went on to play every day, and Shelton was a bench player, but also would fill in and maybe start some games. After each ball game, he would sit in the corner and he would reach up and pull out a notebook and a pen. He was always making notes. And they asked him, they said, what are you, what are you doing that for? And he said, ah, someday I'm going to write a movie. Well, direct the movie. Uh, Shelley was a pretty, pretty bright guy. And uh, sure enough, uh, after his playing days, um, he uh, directed and produced movies like um, Bull Durham, uh, White Men Can't Jump. The whole thing about Bull Durham, um, and I've seen that movie countless times, everything in there was traced to something that either happened with the Rochester Red Wings that I can tell you about, or um, other teams that he may have played on. The one particular thing about Bull Durham is, you remember when they flooded the field? Yes. Okay, so that was down in Richmond, Virginia, when the Red Wings captured the pennant, and they partied all night. Well, the next day, they didn't want to go to the ballpark. So during the night, they drove over, turned on the valves, flooded the field, so they had the day off the next day. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. In the movie, they had a, a lady. She would pick out one player. Was there a young lady that guided a, a young man during the uh, summer? Oh, you had ballpark groupies. No question about it. <laughs> but, you know, you just reminded me of something. What was very popular is that we had broom girls. So between innings, they would come out. No, it was in, it was in the fifth inning. So when they uh, re-raked the infield, broom girl would come out and, of course, was a very attractive blonde that would go and um, sweep off the bases in the first, second, third baseman's uh, spikes. And the fans used to love that concept. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's a, that never heard of Broom Girls. Never heard of anything. They did that something. in 71, too. And I think they had it 73 and 74. And then I don't think they've ever never done it since. But it was pretty popular. People, people always wait in the fifth inning to, for her to come out into the field. To see the broom girl. Any big, big names out there? Well, before the Baltimore Orioles owned uh, the Red Wings, it was the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, Stan Musial came through for a short period of time. Okay. That would have been way before my time. (laughs) Yeah. But you're doing pretty good when you got guys like Bobby Gritch and and Don Baylor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what? so you got to watch the older guys play. What do you... What do you think of this new generation playing the game and, and the new stuff that they're coming out with? Yeah, you know, they don't seem to do some of the basics, you know, the hit and the run. Uh, they do the shifting on the field. You would think they would put a bunt down now to the side where it's weak. They don't necessarily see that. Um, I remember when uh, Gritch and Baylor came back here and were voted into the International League Hall of Fame. That they had made a comment, um, still connected somewhat to their minor league teams, or they show up at spring training. They had said that some of the younger ball players are in such a hurry to go up, get to the next level, that they really weren't perhaps learning or honing their skills as maybe they had. Mm. You do see a difference in the game. You certainly see a lot of harder, harder throwers. Oh my gosh, these guys that throw these pitches at 98 99 regularly yeah yeah they they have a lot of science now and um in 2015 I got lucky enough to uh talk to Mark Kenny and he is uh I'm sorry Brian Kenny from MLB Network and we were talking about just the the science of the numbers and I sit there and I, I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a little old school. I'm 50 years old at, at the time. But I was like, I'm a little old school. And I don't think numbers is baseball. Base, numbers are Sudoku. You want to play Sudoku? Go ahead. But baseball, you can't, you can measure all the numbers you want, but you can't measure heart and you can't measure the mind sometimes. Right. So what wound up happening, he, um, he turned around and he was like, hey, listen, he goes, I understand exactly where you're coming from, but the problem is that the numbers are there. And if you really look at them, you can find yourself a decent player. And I never really understood what he meant until the movie Moneyball came out. And when, when they started talking about, hey, we're trying to get on base percentages and all this stuff. And for the, for the they went from spending all this money for this when they were spending this amount of money and they got that. And it, it was just like, it was like, wow, now I understand the numbers. And he also told me, if you, if you look at some of these guys who had played 10 years, they're, they're actually a Hall of Famer. And he, and he pointed out uh, Matt Stairs to me. Matt Stairs was, uh, he was a journeyman. He was all over the place. I mean, yeah. the, the guy is a first round all-star pick. And I'm like, Matt Stairs, he was on nine different teams in 10 different years. But if you look at his, you know, fielding, if you look at his hitting, if you look at his actual stats and, and look at, he's an all-star, you know, first round all-star. I'm a little bit of a, a umpire fan. How, how'd you treat the umpires back there? Actually, the umpire room was between the home clubhouse and the visiting clubhouse. They had a little room for him. Um, there were times when I might have to help them out with uh, towels. If I had a double header and I had some uh, food left over for a spread, I might bring it over there. Yeah, I mean, they were in their own little little area. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it wasn't, let's see, I was there 71, 73, 70. It wasn't until the 75 season that we figured out we had a, a, 
a water line inside our clubhouse with a shutoff. Okay. And, uh, somebody figured out that was the water line that was going to the umpire's showers. So <laughs> uh, they turned it off, and I had no idea this was going on. So the next day, uh, the umpires had complained. They had to figure out what was going on. So they moved that shutoff to another part. <laughs> <laughs> now you were part. You were in charge of the equipment, correct? Yes. All right. So was anybody ever superstitious with their equipment? They didn't want you touching their cleats or their bat or their glove or something? Um, let's see. You might have somebody like, uh, like I had mentioned, Mike Ferraro, that just might want his uniforms in a certain row with the hangers face in a certain way. But, but no, for the most part, um, didn't have any real superstitions. I know there are players that are like that, but no, not really. Anybody have a really heavy bat they used to use? Uh, Baylor. Very heavy bat. Very heavy bat? Very how, heavy bat. How many ounces? Any idea? Does 33 sound right? I just, or 33 might have been the length. 33 might have been the length. I, I, for Baylor, I swing a 32, 33 yeah. ounce bat. And right. that's, a, that's medium. So I, I'd probably be in the 38 out, 38 ounce. I haven't had to think about that in 40 plus years. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, back to that, uh, that 1971 team, what was so electrifying about that team is the manager, Joe Altabelli, uh, who recently passed away, uh, was the manager of the team, and he was from Rochester. Mm -hmm. And the 71 International League All-Star game that year was in Rochester against the Yankees. And then we won the pennant, the Governor's Cup, and the Junior World Series. Those games were all the Junior World Series against the Denver Bears. Because the Broncos' NFL season started, the Bears didn't have the field in Denver. So all the games were played in Rochester. So it was pretty magical all the way around. Um, some of the, um, when the Yankees came in to play the International League All-Stars, um, I think I remember Bowie Kuhn, wasn't he the commissioner then but a lot of big names we like would come into town and you know it's pretty small cozy ballpark and but everyone fit in and everyone uh, everyone had a great time so what was the town like and what's the town do you live in rochester now correct yeah just in the suburb slightly north so rochester. Was, what's rochester like i mean i know you have uh you probably only have two seasons right you have like or three seasons you, you skip a spring or something like that right yeah no no we're not nah. Solid with four seasons. Okay. Uh, spring, summer, and fall, you can't beat it. Spring's wonderful. Everything's blooming, warming up. Summer, we've got a lot of uh, water around us, Lake Ontario. We have our finger lakes that are all uh, within a half an hour, 45 minutes to enjoy. Uh, the fall with the spectacular colors, it's the winter that's not, uh, <laughs> not the most favorable. And then I'm looking right behind you. Uh, there's the tall Eastman Kodak building. So Rochester at the time was heavy, heavy industry. Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Lomb. Uh, the list goes on and on as far as uh, employment and the, uh, the money that was in this town and the production that we often had. The, okay. Red, Wings, the Red Wings still get supported terrifically. They do a great job there. Uh, it's a, quite the family uh, environment when you go up there with a family or kids so they do quite well okay all right that's a it's a i know it's uh i lived in scranton for a while and i was right next to the triple a yankees and, and got to see a lot of those baby those baby yankees that are that are yankees now i i tell everybody i knew aaron judge when he was aaron oh, mr geez. oh he was he used to strike out something fierce and, and, and I always tell my wife, I said, he just needs somebody to help him fix his stance. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, sure enough, about two weeks later, um, Hideki Matsui and um, Reggie Jackson was up there for about a week. And two weeks later, he started hitting bombs all over the place. I would say when I was growing up, the guy that I admired as did many youngsters at the time was Mickey Mantle. Okay. So I can remember even keeping statistics on the guy as a young kid. And yeah. you know, he came through Rochester for a home run uh, batting contest. Um, Hank Aaron came through town. Bowie Kuhn came through. You know, I had access 
to those guys because if they did put on a uniform, I'd clean it and make sure they were ready to go when they left. I had access to get autographs from those guys. But do you know, for me, it was so easy to get the access, to get the autograph. And they really were in the clubhouse. They didn't want me bothering them for that. But sometimes I look back and I say, oh my gosh, I could have had a baseball with Aaron and Mickey Mantle's name on it. Are you kidding? Brooks Robinson came through one time too. So um, if I had That's any a, regrets, it would be it would be that one little regret. Yeah, not to get those autographs. Yeah. So readily available, but I'll never forget the memories of being able to talk to these guys. You know, I'll tell you what I remember about Mickey Mantle. And if you look at uh, some of the photographs when he swings through the pitch. Okay. You, you look at his number seven on his back and you look at the width of his shoulders. Well, he came into our clubhouse and he didn't have to turn to fit through the door. I don't want to exaggerate like that, but I'll tell you something. You stood in front of that guy and you shook his hand. That guy had shoulders on him like no one I've ever seen. I mean, he mm. was built. Just yeah. Like, Tapered look about him. Tapered look. Yeah, that was uh, that's a, a lot of the when I went uh, to Cooperstown and I got some autographs from players. It was just like mm-hmm. you know I, I tell my kids and they're like, Dad, you could sell this on eBay and you could. But I was like, it's not it's not for sale. It's that's yeah. not. I said there's a story behind the ball and that's that's what the ball is there for. It's to it's to remind me of that story. It was a great story, and uh, I wish it, I wish you had some stuff there. That would be that would be something you can always tell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's all locked in my memory now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, listen, uh, I, I appreciate you being on, and uh, I, I'd like to thank you, and uh, thank you for sharing the memories. Um, there's, uh, I'm sure the uh, the Red Wings will uh, ever forever appreciate your work that you did for them over there. And uh, do, you, do you still go to games? Oh, I do. Yeah, I'm a season ticket holder, and uh, I'm a pretty busy guy, but I try to go to games. If not, I give the tickets away, uh, kids in the neighborhood or um, uh, families, and they'll come back to me and say, you know, I think we were going to try and go to more games. They might end up then buying a package of 10 games or something like that. Okay. No. Uh, and we've also went from um, the Orioles to the Minnesota Twins. And okay. Weren't, uh, the Orioles weren't giving us the talent like they used to. Uh, then I'm not quite sure why the Twins are no longer there. We have the Washington Nationals, so they're closer. Well, I'm I'm hoping to get Davey Martinez on here one day. And um, I, I interviewed, I talked to his brother, Eric Martinez, and he's a coach down here in Florida. He coaches baseball down here. And he played a little bit stint in the minor leagues also. Well, so yeah. I, um, As we had talked uh, when you and I first met uh, earlier today, uh, there are some guys that I'd like you to be put in touch with, and, and I think Ron Shelton might be one of them that uh, might be willing to talk to you. There's, there's another guy that was uh, very much involved with the Red Wings, a right-handed pitcher named Billy Kirkpatrick. Okay. Never made it to the big leagues, got that close. Um, just a heck of a guy, and you talk about the life of a teammate. Oh, this guy was funny kept everybody loose and he was the guy he was often the go-to guy the real grunt um i know he could fill you in a couple hours on baseball stories well listen thank you for being on and um my listeners i'm sure they'll be uh happy to hear some of your stories i'm sure they'll they'll love the stories about the players and stuff it was a lot different back then i used to rely on hanging my uniforms in the outfield wall to get them to dry <laughs> the dryer, you know, that that's how we had to do things back then. Yes, yeah, so, solar power dryer, right? <laughs> exactly that. And you know, back then they were only had one hat to wear for all 144 games. Wow. One hat. One. If the hat yeah. got destroyed or lost or ripped or torn, we might be able to sneak them a new hat. But yeah, that was a lot different back then. No, now they have a I think a whole order sheet. And they, oh, they, they fill out the order sheet and then the team fulfills the order. Oh, that's, that? yeah, yeah, that's, and how you spell the name and, you know, the helmet size and stuff like that. So wow. it's with what I was told that they have a whole order sheet you, and they just check everything off as they go down. That way they can give it to the equipment manager and they can get them their stuff. 
Yeah, that's it. it. Well, anyway, thank you for being on. And uh, everybody, thank you for listening. And remember, as I always say, keep swinging because every striker is going to get you closer to that next home run. There you Thanks. go. How true is that? <laughs> All right. Like and subscribe. Thank you. If you like the show, please do me a favor. Subscribe. Right? Right? You see it? It's right there. Subscribe, share, like, and don't forget, put that bell on. It'll ding you when I put something else on, all right?